a new coating for fusion reactors. Engineers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison have developed a material that can cope with the extremely difficult conditions in a fusion reactor. The new coating performed well during tests in which conditions were similar to those inside a fusion reactor. Scientists indicate that this material could enable the creation of more efficient compact reactors that will be easier to repair and maintain. In their work, American scientists used cold spray coating technology to apply a coating of tantalum, a metal that can withstand high temperatures, to stainless steel. In this way, a material was created that will withstand the difficult conditions in a fusion reactor. The new coating will allow for much better protection of the reactor walls. The fusion community is urgently looking for new manufacturing techniques to economically produce large fusion reactor components. Especially those facing the plasma, said Michaela Ayalovega of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, lead author of the study. Our technology shows significant improvement over current approaches. Thanks to this research, we were the first to demonstrate the benefits of using cold spray coating technology in fusion applications, he adds. The description and results of the work were published in the journal, Physica Scripta. The tantalum coating was tested in the extreme conditions typical of a fusion reactor. The tests were extremely promising. During the observations, scientists noticed that the material was exceptionally good at capturing hydrogen molecules, which is advantageous for compact fusion devices. We found that the cold sprayed tantalum coating absorbs significantly more hydrogen than tantalum applied using standard techniques. Probably due to the unique microstructure of the coating, said Professor Kumar Sridharan of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It was his team that in recent years popularized cold spray coating technology among the nuclear physics community, implementing it in many applications related to fusion reactors. Nuclear fusion is the process that powers stars like our Sun. Mastering how to control it holds the promise of achieving an almost unlimited source of clean energy using a small amount of fuel. The fusion process combines atoms of light elements such as deuterium and tritium into heavier elements such as helium at high temperatures. This produces huge amounts of energy in the form of heat. In fusion devices, plasma, ionized hydrogen gas, is heated to extremely high temperatures, on the order of 100 million degrees Celsius. Only then will the lighter atoms be able to combine to form heavier ones. And it takes a powerful and stable magnetic field to keep the plasma in check. The energy produced by the fusion reaction should maintain the temperature, and excess heat can be converted into electricity. However, in this process some hydrogen ions may escape from the plasma. This can cause power loss in the plasma, which makes keeping the plasma hot and producing an efficient small fusion reactor very difficult, Ilo Vega says. Therefore, scientists decided to create a new surface for the reactor walls facing the plasma that could capture hydrogen particles colliding with the walls. Tantalum is naturally good at absorbing hydrogen, and scientists suspected that creating a coating of tantalum through a cold spray process would further enhance its ability to capture hydrogen. Creating a coating is a bit like using a can of spray paint. It involves throwing particles of the coating material onto the surface at supersonic speed. Upon impact, 
The particles flatten like pancakes and cover the entire surface while maintaining nanoscale boundaries between coating particles. Scientists have found that it is these tiny boundaries that facilitate the capture of hydrogen particles. Ilo Vega conducted experiments on the coated material at facilities in France and Germany. In the process, he discovered that heating the material to a higher temperature removes trapped hydrogen particles without modifying the coatings, a process that essentially regenerates the material so it can be reused. Another big advantage of the cold spray method is that it allows reactor components to be repaired on site by applying a new coating. Currently, damaged reactor components often have to be removed and replaced with a completely new part, which is expensive and time consuming, says Ilo Vega. The creation of a refractory metal composite with well-controlled hydrogen handling combined with erosion resistance and overall material toughness is a breakthrough in the design of plasma devices and fusion energy systems. The prospect of changing the alloy and incorporating other refractory metals to improve the composite for nuclear applications is particularly exciting, emphasizes Professor Oliver Schmitz. Humans may have influenced the evolution of dog eye color. The eye color of most dogs is darker than that of their closest relatives, wolves. According to Japanese scientists, this suggests that dogs owe their darker eye color to domestication. According to this concept, darker eyes are friendlier, so puppies with this eye color were more likely to be kept as pets. All domesticated dogs are believed to have descended from an ancient ancestor, the now extinct species of wolf. Their closest living relative is the gray wolf. And the color of his eyes is mostly honey yellow. Scientists suspect that the extinct ancestor of dogs had a similar eye color to the gray wolf. In new research published in the journal, Royal Society Open Science. A team of specialists from Takeo University of Science and Showa University in Japan wondered where dogs got dark eyes and what impact humans had on it. Most wolves have a piercing yellow glare that has given many people goosebumps. Meanwhile, dogs mostly have brown eyes, a shade that humans may have chosen because it looks less threatening. Scientists suggest that dogs owe their darker eye color to human perception. Since domestication, humans have chosen animals that seem friendly and obedient to them. According to them, darker eyes are friendlier, which is why puppies with this eye color were more likely to be kept as pets. This research is one of many looking at how humans have changed the appearance of dogs over thousands of years. It turns out that this also applies to the eye color of our four-legged friends. Our common history begins around 20,000 years ago. Years ago, dogs are believed to be the first species domesticated by humans. However, Determining when and where this occurred remains a matter of debate. The light irises of wolves can be useful for communication in the wild because they make the eyes more visible, allowing the animals to better convey information such as gaze direction, which is important for dominant wolves in a pack. However, over 90% domestic dog breeds have dark irises and they all come from wolves. In their study, a group of scientists compared photos of 22 gray wolves with 81 photos of domestic dogs of various breeds, paying particular attention to the color of their irises. They noticed that almost all the dogs had darker eyes than the wolves, 
in many cases much darker. They say this raises the possibility that dogs with darker eyes have been selectively selected over thousands of years. Previous research by another group of scientists has shown that people perceive other people and other animals with darker eyes as friendlier than those with lighter or blue eyes. The team conducted an experiment. In graphics programs, the researchers changed the color of the dog's eyes and showed the images to volunteers, mostly college students, asking them to rate each dog on characteristics such as friendliness, aggression, maturity and intelligence. Volunteers were much more likely to rate the dog as friendly when it had dark eyes in the photo. Participants also rated these dogs as less intelligent and less mature, more like puppies. Over the course of dog evolution, having large, friendly dark eyes may have proven more advantageous than the light eyes that help communicate with other animals in the wild. The research team noted that one reason people may perceive dogs with darker eyes as friendlier is that it is more difficult to determine the size of the pupils. We speculate that a darker iris makes it more difficult to distinguish the size of the pupil and thus gives the illusion of a large pupil, which is related to our perception. Because larger pupils are more reminiscent of an infant, said Akatsugu Kono, the first author of the study. The largest plant in the world found off the coast of Australia. It covers an area of 180 kilometers and has 4.5 thousand square meters. Years. Covering an area of over 180 square kilometers. The seagrass meadow growing on the seabed off the coast of Australia has been considered the largest plant in the world. Analyzing DNA taken from different ends of the meadow. Scientists were surprised to discover that it was actually one plant that had been continuously cloning itself for almost 4,500 years. Australian scientists have located what they claim is the largest plant on Earth. They estimate that the seagrass, Posidonia australis, growing on the seabed in Shark Bay on the west coast of Australia is at least 4,500 years old. This ancient and extremely hardy plant, stretching over 180 square kilometers, was located by scientists from the University of Western Australia and Flinders University. The discovery was described in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. The discovery happened accidentally. Scientists wanted to find out how genetically diverse the seagrass meadows in Shark Bay are and what should be done to protect them. We are often asked how many different plants grow among seagrass meadows. And this time we used genetic tools to answer that question, says Dr. Elizabeth Sinclair from the University of Western Australia. The team collected samples of seagrass shoots from different locations in Shark Bay with different salinities. Genetic analyzers revealed that the entire meadow is actually one organism. The answer blew us away. It was one plant, says Jane Edgelow from the University of Western Australia, the lead author of the study. One plant grew over an area of 180 kilometers in Shark Bay, making it the largest known plant on Earth, he adds. Further analysis revealed that, unlike other seagrasses in the area, P. Astralis actually clones itself through an underground network of branching roots. The plant produces a genetically identical sucker via an underground stem or rhizome, which then develops its own roots and stem. 
when viewed from the surface, in this case, the sandy seabed, the seagrass beds look like separate specimens. But at the genetic level they are one large plant. A similar organism is Pando growing in Utah, USA. A forest of genetically identical aspen trees, Populus tremuloides, which is considered one of the oldest organisms living on our planet. Each of approximately 47,000 trees share the same genetic material and are connected to others through a complex root system called the polycormon. The plant is also notable for its endurance. P. Astralis appears to be very hardy, experiencing a wide range of temperatures and salinities and extremely high light conditions which together would be very stressful for most plants, Sinclair points out. Tolerance to extreme environmental conditions may have something to do with the fact that P. Astralis has twice as many chromosomes as its relatives, meaning it is a polypoidal organism. In most cases, a seagrass seedling inherits half of the genome from each parent. However, polyploids carry the entire genome. The new seedling contains 100% of each parent's genome, rather than sharing the usual 50%, Sinclair says. Polyploid plants are often found in places with extreme environmental conditions. They are often sterile, but they can still grow if the growth is not disturbed, he adds. Based on the plant's size and growth rate, scientists determined the approximate age of the organism. This species generally grows at a rate of up to 35 centimeters per year. Thus, they estimated that it took the plant at least 4,500 years to grow to its current size. Bagorexia. Men have eating disorders too. Most often, men struggle with a disorder that has much in common with anorexia, fixation on their own body, distorted perception of it and subordination of their entire life to the care of their body. Obsessively building muscle mass can lead to serious problems. The causes of the disorder may be different, low self-esteem, incorrect perception of one's masculinity, the influence of the environment presenting unreal images of the male body. The problem often begins in youth. The name may rightly be associated with anorexia. However, while in anorexia, which most often affects young women and girls, one of the symptoms is a distorted sense of one's own body as too fat. In bagorexia, which most often affects men, the morbid perception consists in the feeling of too little muscle mass. Even if it is as much as, for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The term, bagorexia, was coined at the end of the 20th century by psychiatrist Harrison Pope who described an obsession with the body and muscles. Similarly to anorexia, there is a morbid focus on the body with disturbed self-esteem. But the physical effects are in a sense the opposite. Instead of losing weight, the goal is to build as much muscle mass as possible. Such a person spends an unnaturally long time analyzing his or her appearance, measuring muscles and fat tissue. Life focuses on training and diet, other matters are subordinated to them. The diet becomes unnaturally restrictive, often enriched with numerous supplements and sometimes anabolic steroids. of course, has consequences of a very physical nature,
problems with potency, skin, digestive, excretory and circulatory systems. It is not easy to recognize bagorexia, among others. Due to its insidiousness, the effects of unhealthy behavior may seem positive, especially at the beginning. A nice figure, a seemingly healthy lifestyle, exercise, taking care of the diet. When it comes to therapy, it usually includes various methods, mainly psychotherapy, but also the help of a dietitian. Sometimes the participation of a psychiatrist is necessary. The genesis of the disorder can be complex. One of the reasons may be low self-esteem compensated by muscle development. It may also be important, among others, perception of one's own masculinity. Scientists from the Australian National University and the University of Sydney noticed, for example, that victims of bagorexia identify more strongly with culturally accepted stereotypical masculine characteristics than other gym users. It is worth mentioning that among men suffering from anorexia, there were more of them who were more comfortable with typically female roles. This does not mean that men with anorexia were less masculine, or those with muscular dystrophy, more masculine than volunteers from the control group. However, the results indicate the growing pressure on men to define their masculinity in the modern world, says Dr. Stuart Murray, who led the study. The ubiquitous images of muscular torsos seen on television, cinema, music videos, even computer games, and the frequent admiration for the unnaturally muscular male body do not help. It is obvious that a bodybuilder does not look the same at home as he does during competitions, and the use of steroids is a separate issue. Similarly, an actor doesn't look the same offset as he does on film, especially since the special effects are getting better and better. However, these nuances are not always thought about. Muscle social media leaders have huge audiences, which makes it tempting to follow in their footsteps. Researchers from Flinders University have shown, for example, that such messages have a significant impact on men. They showed 300 volunteers aged 18 to 30 randomly selected images of naked male torsos, clothed models, or control, neutral images. As it turned out, photos with muscles significantly lowered body satisfaction, compared to fashion photos or, for example, landscapes. At the same time, photos of good-looking muscular men inspired volunteers to exercise. Despite the increase in social media use, little research has been done on its impact on men. Our experiment showed similarities and differences between the reactions of women and men. Although all participants showed a certain susceptibility to certain types of photos, the results usually obtained when working with women cannot be easily generalized to men, emphasizes the author of the study, Professor Marika Tigerman. Young people may be particularly susceptible to the influence of the media and problems with self-perception. The New York Times just published an extensive article about the dangerous over-concentration of male teenagers on building muscle. The thoughts of such young people can obsessively revolve around the gym, protein diets and supplements, the authors show, stating, among others, specific examples. These observations are confirmed by research conducted, among others, at the University of California, San Francisco, according to which muscle dysmorphia often begins in the teenage period. 
30% teenagers participating in the analysis tried to improve their musculature, and 40% of them had the correct weight. At the same time, a team from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, examining people aged 15 on average from various schools, noticed that as many as 17% respondents with normal weight were dissatisfied with it, and 24% complained about her figure. Interestingly, school athletes felt particularly bad. In this group, over 29% were dissatisfied with their weight, and almost 33% in appearance. People who work with teenage boys should be aware that they may develop body dissatisfaction and may engage in compensatory activities that are potentially harmful to their developmental health, the researchers say. Supporting positive body image and healthy self-esteem, awareness of potentially harmful behaviors and early intervention are key, they add, emphasizing the fundamental role of coaches, teachers, doctors and caregivers.